This is your weekly music show, Bandwidth, on CBC Radio 1, 91.5 in Ottawa, 88.3 in Thunder Bay, and in North Bay, 96.1. So you and I stay. This is a song called Cage by North Bay searchlight contender Cole Fournier. It's gorgeous stuff. I called up Cole at school one weekday morning. He'd come straight from his spec ed course. I had to ask what that was. It's learning how to educate children with ADD or other learning challenges. Cole graduated with an English degree and then he says he decided to save a year of his life and a few grand and get into Teachers College right now because of course it's going to become a two-year program across Ontario very soon. Now, he wanted to be a firefighter when he was a kid, but he told me he never hit the growth spurt that would give him the musculature to be a firefighter, in his opinion. Uh, He also has a YouTube channel with some very hilarious rants. He calls them, everything is terrible and nobody cares, and they will suck minutes out of your workday as they've done mine, as you laugh at them over and over. Cole Fournier has done much with his quarter century on this planet, and something tells me we actually haven't seen anything yet. He's also, in this time, had his heart broken, and like many a troubadour before him, it was fodder for a gorgeous record. His debut album, One Morning, I'm Going to Wake Up. Here is my conversation with the North Bay man with the silver tongue, Cole Fournier, on Bandwidth. Hello, Cole. Hello. You've got a lot going on right now. Let's start with the uh, brand new debut record. I'm so excited for you. One Morning, I'm Going to Wake Up. Today. I've remade my mistakes To purify the way in which they fill my cheeks with heat but It's an intriguing title. It has some intriguing inkblot art on the cover, which we'll get to. But let's start with the title, Cole. Why did you go with that one? Um, for a couple months, I, I wrestled with the title. There's a lot of themes about fire, ghosts, all sorts of different like hauntings and fears and stuff. And... Um, I'm always plagued by dreams and really vivid dreams that aren't nightmares in so much that there's something weird going on. They're always just regular everyday life things. Like I could wake up, go to school for a week or two, and then I wake up and I'm like, oh my God, that didn't happen. And I just basically said one morning I'm going to wake up. Like I'm not going to have these weird dreams anymore about my past and about things that I can't change. And I'm going to wake up and realize that this is my life and I have to deal with it. I know that I'm not making sense, but every chance I get, I will distill my memories. And my cheeks, they grow numb as their taste catches up to fill my spindly limbs with all their blue, black, royal, navy blood. Interesting. I want to hear a little bit more about these dreams. I don't want to dwell on it, but I think that it's a neat um, aspect, I guess, of, of artistry and of your life. Explore a little bit more what you mean about when you have their recurring dreams about normal things, is it? Yeah, just normal everyday things. Like um, everyone's had that dream where they where they wake up and they think they won the lottery and it takes them a couple minutes to sort of realize, no, wait, that didn't happen because like this person was there. And, and it couldn't have happened because like that was Tuesday and today's Wednesday, that, that sort of stuff. Whereas like a lot of dreams that I have are intensely, intensely vivid to the point that I wake up and like maybe three or four days later, I'll realize that an entire section of my life didn't happen. And it's, yeah, it's something that I got looked into recently. It's, it's more about the people that sort of haunt my dreams and the people from my past that are in there. So all the songs are about people that aren't in my life anymore, but that still show up regularly in this, in my, yeah, in my dreams. Oh Lord, how this light attaches to a dream. You do have a lot of mentions uh, in your in your work about faraway places. You open with Austria, which I understand was written back in high school. Yeah. 
Austria was basically just about um, I was 17. I was working at a summer camp. I was dating this girl. I was kind of a bit of a not nasty, not niceness is the term that I'll use instead of the uh, non-radio friendly term to this girl. We had a very rough, tumultuous relationship. Uh, she moved away to Austria and luckily we ended up becoming friends again. And the reason why I say luckily is because almost immediately after we had become friends, she actually got hit by a train and um, died. The whole song is basically about sort of saying what you need to say before like before bad stuff happens because you never really know when that when that you're when someone's gonna not be there anymore. Your tongue tied and trembling, falling faster, breaking the clouds as the ground holds you close to the sound of a million miles singing in sweet fluorescent unison. Do you have a different perspective on even singing that song than you may have when you when you wrote it? Um, it's it's hard to say just because I still when I when I look at the songs I I get a very vivid image of where I was and who I was, and it's hard for me to sing that song any different way because when I when I sing it and I I still feel like I'm that young person and I still feel like I wish I could say sorry more. So I don't ever feel like, oh, well, you know what, like things happen. It, it just kind of when I when I sing my songs, I still sing them from the place where I wrote them. You're lucky that you have such a great piece of music that you can still identify with, because I think a lot of people would want to distance themselves from a song they wrote when they were a teenager. And yours is yeah. is really um, well formed at from from having written it at such an early age so you. oh you're welcome it's a beautiful way to open the album I, I it really arrested me right off the bat and I thought okay yeah I want to hear more I'm, get, I'm getting through this this is beautiful and while I'm not being sarcastic when I see you home my dreams I've tried to kill the nights with these drugs and caffeine but now sleep is crawling closer like a blanket around my feet before climbing up my chest and smother in me. Paris also gets a song title. You fit Bombay, Australia, China, even the moon, uh, obviously places you've not necessarily been. Why do you have the fascination with the far flung and away? Uh, the, the Paris thing was a song that I wrote while I was in Paris and it was about a dream again that I had where this girl from my past was haunting me and the entire song is a literal translation of the, the dream that I had where this girl Pretended just kept that showing she worked up. at the Louvre? Yeah, and she was like in there and it was a, like I said, I was in Paris and I was having these dreams about being at the, so that one's a literal translation. The other ones later on in the album, basically from um, Shower Scene onwards, are about one specific girl. And they're all places that she and and I had talked about going um, and had planned on going together. And obviously things didn't work out, but that's where, they, uh, that's where the song titles sort of come from. Oh, all the best records come from those experiences. <laughs> all oh, the best all songs. the sad, sappy ones. <laughs> it's true. The boy loses girl. Distance and time And I'll set the floor of the scene Under cheap Christmas lights You say then it was perfect But it ain't today Okay, well, that, I mean, it does explain then to that extent that you wanted to work those things in and, and fit her and that experience in. Uh, have you any song titles about Espanola, New Liskard, Pembroke, places that are in your everyday sphere? Northern Ontario song titles. I don't, I don't, uh, well, I, I have another project called White Coals and we have a song mm -hmm. where the, where the uh, main chorus is, where did you go when the sun came down on this North Ontario town? That's about the most. We say North Ontario town. We don't get specific. 
We sort of keep it like a Neil Young with the there's a town in North Ontario. I like we that We don't want to single anyone out. Well, that's good. Maybe uh, at least you're balancing things out between your, your different musical facets. Now, because you mentioned White Coals, I'm going to jump to that because this, of course, is your solo album, but there has been or is still White Coals, um, the duo slash full band that you're in. And I, I like your tagline that you write about, write songs about parties, drinking and dancing the night away with strangers, the difference between love and lust and the general trials and tribulations growing up in northern Ontario. What are some of those trials and tribulations at of growing up in North Bay, winter, winter. winter. You don't think we have winter, and well, we're we're not very much south, but in Ottawa or Regina or anywhere else. Well, I think that in in a smaller northern Ontario town, it's it's a lot more difficult because in in Ottawa um, or to, or Toronto, which like also gets winter, is is there's things to do in North Bay, and I'm sure a lot of other northern towns can relate. Is that there's literally just nothing. There's a ski hill and there's bars, and if you can afford the ski hill, you go there, and if you can't afford the ski hill, you go to the bars, and that's something that I think every Northern Ontario person can can really relate to, is that there's not, there's not a lot of art, there's not a lot of uh, culture, there's just waiting for winter to be over to be able to be outside and, and go swimming and do things that don't involve drinking. This house was warmer before I let you in. That's why I'm kicking you out now For everything goes now again Do you think that's changed a little bit than maybe even 10, 15 years ago um, with the ability for kids, for people to make music in their bedrooms on their laptops and contribute more culturally? Definitely, definitely. I think with the, the, the whole MySpace era, and though MySpace is dead, MySpace really like brought out the ability for everyone to share mm-hmm. for for people that might not have ever had an opportunity for anyone to ever hear their music to share it on a worldwide uh, basis. Whereas before it might have been just uh, you were playing a couple of shows to like 20 or 30 friends and you'll never be seen outside of the city. But like now with the ability, with the ease of using computers and the ease of home recording and the ease of sharing everything on the internet, it's it's given you something to do outside of uh, drinking and sitting in your house. So the whole album was a really determined effort. Like we said, it goes back now, what is that, eight years. Like a woman who's just given birth, I I saw that you've said, let's not talk about number two. There may not be a number two. (laughs) Why was it so important for you to make number one? Uh, The honest answer is I basically we wrote it the the last half of the album was as you know about one specific girl and like any person that's watched the notebook one too many times you always think of that one thing that you can do for the person that'll make them change their mind and that was basically what this was and like this is like two and a half years now she's she's been out of my out of my life but um the idea of recording it started coming up and we we got together and as you know, as you may know, uh, recording an album is not like an easy task. It's not a quick thing that you can do over a couple of weeks. And then all of a sudden, like a year and a half later, it's finally coming out with the person that it, it was about not being uh, around anymore. Does it matter what, what, what she thinks of it? I don't know. I, I don't know. I've sort of wrestled with that a bit. I think that in one way it would be nice if she was heard these and was like oh these are about me like that's that's cute awesome whatever um and was really moved but at the same time i i I think with becoming older you get a little bit more realistic and as as terrible as that sounds uh, a little bit of optimism dies (laughs) with age and you sort of realize that sometimes people just don't care anymore so and it's okay yeah in a way yeah Mm -hmm. it's okay I'll be the rock that you left unturned You'll be the bad karma God knows that I've earned I tried to be good, but this needed better Okay, so you're going to finally release your debut album, uh, so beautiful, and you're in Teacher's College right now. What's going to happen next musically? Mm, Next musically? I was thinking about going to... Korea to go teach but then I sort of have decided recently that I might move to Toronto and do the hard thing and try to be a nobody in Toronto instead of a 
famous person in North Bay. So that might be the next step. Go to Toronto, cut my teeth and playing bars and doing all that stuff and sort of try to get myself in there. What about comedy, though, Cole? Because I watched a couple of your Everything's Terrible and Nobody Cares YouTube rants. Honestly, they were spot on. I was laughing out loud. The, the two, My two favorites were the return messages and the airport complainers. Like, well, well done. What about maybe pursuing something like that? I honestly could see you writing for the Rick Mercer report. I would love. My mom got me Rick Mercer's book for Christmas, and I had never really paid much attention to him before. And and she gave it to me, saying these this, these will help you with your rants. And I uh, I'm a big fan of Rick Mercer now, and I would love to do something like that. Comedy's always been my my main background. I started as like a drama kid. Ah. Uh, I was always a drama kid first, and then eventually, girls like musicians more. So that sort of took. <laughs> <laughs> precedent <laughs> at a young age. What's your biggest rant-worthy beef right now? Oh, yoga pants. Yoga pants are not pants. It's the same equivalent as if I were to wear long johns to, to a public place. People would be calling the police saying that I'm being lewd because I'm showing off whatever goods and services I have to offer. But girls just wear these tight, tight pants and it, they're, they're just underwear. You're just wearing long underwear. It's not acceptable. They're still pajamas. <laughs> They're still pajamas, but just extra tight. <laughs> Lastly, I, I think I'm going to play my favorite track so far anyways. I think once I spin the record 10 more times, it could change 10 times. But right now I love Bombay all the time. It's got a little rootsy Canadiana sort of in it. Can you tell me a little bit more about what inspired this particular one? Uh, that one was written the day uh, that, uh, well, a couple of days before the girl uh, was was leaving and it was just about um, thinking and worrying and being afraid about what happens with distance and what happens when someone when someone leaves and it's about yeah that that fear of what's going to happen but the great world just keeps spinning the world just keeps spinning and and you're just along for the ride and nothing you can do can change some things so yeah, you write darn good love songs my friend you really do thank you. you're welcome well thank you so much for taking the time at school to in the middle of your school day to talk about your music and you know I hope it takes you all around Ontario so everybody else can get a chance to see you play live once your semester is done the mother in me is uh, yes, shaking my finger yes. at you <laughs> yeah my mother will appreciate you for that and thank you so much for having me too this is Cole Fournier and you're listening to Bandwidth on CBC Radio 1 with Amanda Puts 96.1 FM in North Bay for all the time it would take me and the gospels I could sing But when your vow was upon it skywards 